For a broader perspective now, not just on the tragedy in Las Vegas, but more generally on how Americans are thinking about themselves and their country, we've reached James Fallows. He's an award-winning author and national correspondent for The Atlantic magazine. For decades, he has traveled extensively in the U.S. and around the world. Over the past four years, he has been speaking to people across the U.S. about their views of their country and their communities for his American Futures project. James Fallows spoke to me from Washington. You've written that mass shootings have become part of the American identity. You say this is who we are. What do you mean? I mean by that, that the, the phenomenon of people going crazy and having guns and shooting large numbers of their fellow citizens is not unique to the United States. It's happened over the decades in Scotland and in Australia and, and elsewhere. What is unique in American culture is the the normalization of these things where week after week you have just, you know, dozens of people being killed. And so the question is not what it is in American culture that leads people to these acts of violence, but what it is in America's political environment that means it seems that we seem incapable of having uh, solutions. Hmm. You, Americans often, I mean, you, you say that's sort of the negative aspect to American exceptionalism or the American idea. Tell me, it's sort of in this broader context, what that is. What is the American idea? So, you know, I'm speaking to you now from the offices of the Atlantic magazine, where I've worked for a long time. It was actually founded before the U.S. Civil War in 1857 to explore the American idea, which it defined as some sense of possibility of creating a new society, of incorporating people from around the world, something that also is true in different ways of Canada and Australia and other large multi-ethnic societies, but has its, I think, its special existence in the United States. And as I've lived around the world in Asia and in Europe and in Africa, I've, you know, I've respected all these different cultures, but I've come to appreciate more the unusual quality of the inclusiveness and the sense of possibility and the mixture between myth in the sense of falsehood, but also myth in the sense of inspiration that we find throughout uh, America's history. So most aspects of American exceptionalism I recognize in their positive way, but in terms of the observed behavior of the United States right now, this tolerance for, for gun violence and complacency with it really is exceptional and unique in a way that is to our collective American national shame. Because it raises the question if, if politicians or the sort of political leadership has been unable to, to stop this or change the trajectory in some way, you can't help but wonder if that isn't there because a broad range of the American public doesn't want that part of their identity to change. Uh, I, uh, I put more emphasis, I put less emphasis on the American heritage frontier, Wild West identity part of this than I do on some changes in just the practicalities of American politics over the last generation plus. You know, opinion polls do show that most Americans uh, favor some kind of reasonable controls on guns, of making it harder to have automatic or semi-automatic weapons, to have more thorough background checks, to have waiting periods, the sorts of things that other countries have done after their gun massacres and have, have uh, put, put a stop to this sort of thing. But it's the, the way in which uh, politics, especially of the Republican Party right now, seem to operate. Uh, most politicians think they have more to lose by standing up against a very um, ferocious uh, minority of people who feel as if it's all or nothing about uh, their, their right to hold, uh, to, to bear any kind of arms, and a less um, engaged majority that says, yes, they'd like things to be different, but they're not casting their votes strictly on the basis of this issue. And I think it's that question of political hydraulics, if you will, that has put the U.S. in this uh, predicament right now. I want to ask you a little bit about outlook beyond just the horror of this past week. You travel the country a lot talking to people, and I know it's been one of your big projects traveling across the United States. How mm -hmm. would you judge the way Americans' outlook has changed uh, over the course of your travels, particularly in the age of Trump? One of the, so my wife Deb and I have been traveling, as you said, over the last four years. We spent about half of our time on the road in smaller American communities, which, as it happened, mainly went for Donald Trump um, a, a year ago. 
and we have a book coming out about this next year, and essentially our argument is that when it comes to national, national politics in specific, Americans really are as bitter and as divided and as fractious as everybody would, would think. And if you go out of your way to ask them, do you like Donald Trump, do you like Hillary Clinton, you'll get these sort of polarized um, narratives and polarized denunciations. If you don't ask them those things, which we generally didn't, and if you ask them what's happening in your town, what do you hope and fear, what's better, what's worse, how are things going in your schools, what about the economic situation, what's um, good or bad about this state or this region, most people feel as if their specific communities and families and institutions are in a better and improving rather than deteriorating stage of history. That is, if you didn't know about national politics in the United States right now, you might think it was a relatively good time in American uh, history. I know that's contrary to the main narrative, but that's, that's what we found and have been reporting. So it's trying to bridge the gap between the very uh, just bitter national politics, as bad as they've been except for the Civil War, and a sense of firsthand American life that is much more positive and, and uh, practical. That's one of the challenges for the U.S. now. How do you explain that discrepancy? I think that, that it's, um, you know, this is not the first time the U.S. or any other society has had this kind of challenge. There was uh, just about a century ago, Walter Lippmann wrote a book called Public Opinion, where he was arguing the great, the great challenge of that media age. Of, this was, of course, before TV and when radio was just uh, in its, its infancy, was to, um, what he was, uh, he was to match what he called the pictures in our minds with the realities of daily life. And he was saying that uh, the sort of the seeds of World War I were being set with distorted pictures from Europe, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that, that we have reached a sort of intense moment where the idea people have about life they don't experience directly is more um, at odds and polarized and sort of negative than, um, than, than has been the case in many other times in our history. So, so I don't, uh, th that is the challenge I'm trying to wrestle with as opposed to a challenge for which I have a solution to offer right now. <laughs> How much do you think we in the media have to take some responsibility for that, dis that difference in view? I think that, that uh, certainly the, the media is part of this. The, the, and, you know, 20 years ago I wrote a book called uh, Breaking the News, mm -hmm. which was just in the dawn of the cable news era, saying that, that uh, there, was a, there was a risk in blending the concepts of entertainment and information. That an entertainment, by definition, whatever was most interesting and spectacular at that moment and would draw people's attention, um, you know, sort of eclipsed anything else because that's what entertainment is for. And that I, I argue that historically there was a separate protected realm for the news as there was for education and for religion and other things that weren't purely immediately market driven. Um, now that seems like a quaint concept that there could be any difference at all between entertainment and, and information. And I think part of the battle of the Trump era in the United States and the Brexit era in the UK and some of the uh, comparable eras in, in continental Europe is to re-establish the idea that there is some realm of public knowledge that we need that's important to defend and that we in the media are trying to re-establish as the reason for our existence uh, to, to help democ to allow democracies to function. Mm -hmm. You describe yourself as an optimist about the American idea, and you have also said that President Trump has dealt that idea a grievous blow. Are you still an optimist? Um, I studied American history when I was in college long ago, and the, the lesson of American history is essentially it's always been bad. <laughs> if you name any decade in U.S. history, there's a depression, there are strikes, there's ethnic friction. Of course, there was a civil war, but really, in any, almost any decade of American history, people felt as if things were coming apart. And generally, the, you know, the weakness of the nation, one of, one of its many weaknesses, is its tolerance for these kind of extreme forces. The, the success of the nation has been its ability to get out of trouble just at, at the last moment. And so, generally, the more I've lived around the world, the more I've been impressed by the rebound capacity of the United States. I think that the coming of Donald Trump by my lights 
is a very serious challenge to the democratic idea and the American idea that a person like this could be the victor in a democratic process. And we're seeing right now the ways the rest of civic society in the United States, the judiciary, um, the ordinary electorate, uh, the Congress, including Republican-controlled Congress, the civil service can respond to the challenge of a man who is unlike any other president. So that drama is being uh, fought out and played out right now. I want to thank you very much for your time and for your uh, observances of that drama. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Allison.